God creates us as a demonstration of His glory. And so, so what do we do? Here is what we must do. We do not have a choice. We are compelled, constrained by the gospel to fight abortion as an assault on God's creation and as an affront to God's glory. Cultural implication number one, based on biblical foundation number one, we fight abortion as an assault on God's creation and an affront to God's glory. I live in a country where a million babies are aborted every year. 3,000 every day. That's one baby being aborted every 20 to 25 seconds. And that's just our country. We live in a world where 130,000 abortions occur every day. 130,000 babies. We're watching Syria right now, where upwards of 100,000 Syrians have been tragically and mercilessly killed in violent ways in that country. And yet every single day, a moral disaster of even greater proportions is taking place. 130,000 helpless babies being dismembered and destroyed, and we hardly even notice it. I do not believe it is an overstatement to call abortion a modern holocaust. I believe that is an understatement. Every month we surpass that number of people systematically slaughtered in the world. And just as German Christians did not need to hide from the reality of what was happening in concentration camps, we in this room cannot hide, must not hide from the reality of what is happening in abortion clinics all around our country and all around the world. Why not? Why can't we hide? Because of the gospel. Because of the biblical foundations we have just seen. Abortion is a clear affront to God's glory, is our creator. He is our creator. He alone has the power and authority to give life. And he alone has the power and authority to take life. We do not decide when someone lives or dies. God decides when someone lives or dies. Abortion is an affront to his glory as our creator. And an attack an assault on his work in creation. Remember David's words in Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, in intricately woven in the depths of the earth. David says the way you formed my inward parts, the way you knit me together in my mother's womb, this work of creation is a demonstration of your glory. And it is, isn't it? It's a glorious demonstration. A God, David didn't even know what we know. A God takes a little egg and sperm and brings them together. And how two weeks later, a human heart is beating, circulating its own blood. Then a few more weeks, fingers forming on hands, brain waves detectable. After just six and a half weeks, inward parts moving. Two weeks later, discernible fingerprints, discernible sexuality, kidneys forming and functioning. Then a gallbladder. By the twelfth week, all the organs of a baby's body are functional and the baby can cry. All of this within three months, one trimester. Heart, organs, brain, sexuality, movement, reaction. And God on high is doing every single detail as a demonstration of His glory. So to imagine at that moment, during that time period, inserting a tool, taking a pill, undergoing an operation that takes the life God is designing and destroying. This is without question an assault on God's glory, glorious work in creating a person in His image. And that is the crux of the debate, isn't it? What is really going on in that womb? And the Bible is clear that God is forming a person in His image in that womb. And that gospel reality changes everything. You think about it. If, that, if, if the unborn is not a person, is not human, then no justification for abortion is even necessary. People say the unborn is not a human person. It's just a non-viable tissue mass, merely a part of a woman's body. Others say it's a potential human or a human that's not yet a person. And the reality is if that's true, then the argument's over. No justification for abortion necessary. However, if the unborn is human, then no justification for abortion is adequate. No justification. This is where I'm, I'm indebted to Gregory Kugel, who wrote a little booklet called Precious Unborn Human Persons. Great little resource. People say abortion is such a complex issue. There's no easy answers. 
But if that which is in the womb is a person formed by God, this issue is not complex at all. Think about it. If it's true that that what is in the womb is a person, then every single justification for abortion falls apart. People say, well, women have a right to privacy with their doctors. Certainly, we all have a right to a measure of privacy, but no privacy argument is a cover for doing serious harm to another innocent human being. We have laws that invade our privacy all the time when we start harming another's human welfare. Privacy is not the issue here, but women should have the freedom to choose. Some things, sure, but not all things. Yes, we have freedom to choose whether or not to have children. We don't have freedom to simply eliminate toddlers or teenagers who are inconvenient to us. No woman has the freedom to kill her child if it's a child, right? But making abortions illegal forces women into back alleys with coat hangers. If it's dangerous to kill a person, should we make it easier for them? But more children will create a drain on the economy when human beings get expensive. Do we eliminate them? This makes no sense. It's utterly ludicrous if the person, if, if what is going on in the womb is, the, is a person created in the image of God. Everything, everything in the abortion debate revolves around what's happening in that womb. And scripture is clear. God is creating a person as a demonstration of his glory. You cannot believe the word of God and deny this. And you cannot believe the word of God and stay silent on this. And yet so many Christians and pastors, we sit back and say hardly nothing. Well, Christians and churches say, I wouldn't have an abortion, but I don't think that we should take someone else's right to choose away from them. That's not our place. That's not the government's place. But that's a sham argument, and we all know it is. Government exists under the authority of God for the good of people. And part of that good is accomplished by limiting people's right to choose. People can't just do, choose to steal whenever they want, drive as fast as they want, do whatever they want with no consequences. If that were the case, we live in anarchy. It's moral silliness and cultural suicide to say that everyone should have the right to do whatever they choose to do. Thankfully, we take people's right to choose evil away from them every day as a society. And that's good for all of us. Oh, Christian, this is where I want to call you out of the muddled middle road that is masking the magnitude of what kind of choice we're talking about. To say you are pro-choice, pro-choice about what? Whether you have Mexican or Chinese food, where you live, what kind of car you drive, of course you're pro-choice. But are you pro-choice about rape? Are you pro-choice about kidnapping? Are you pro-choice about burglary? Then why are you pro-choice about killing children? Brothers and sisters, moral or political neutrality here is not an option for those who believe this gospel. There is a battle raging in our culture. And if I, if you and I sit idly by while millions of children, individuals in the image of God all around us are dismembered and destroyed, then we are denying basic biblical truth that forms the foundation for the very gospel we claim to believe. In the words of Randy Alcorn, to endorse or even be neutral about killing innocent children created in God's image is unthinkable in the scriptures, was unthinkable to Christians in church history, and should be unthinkable to Christians today.